Welcome to laboratory activity number four, the one about discrete random variables. A random variable is the outcome of an experiment. Notice that it's future tense. A discrete random variable is a random variable that can take on innumerable values. That is, you can list them out. It may take you forever, but you can actually list out. There is a first value, there is a second value, there is a third value. Next lab, we're going to contrast that with continuous random variables where there is no, no uh, enumerability. Examples of discrete random variables include the number of accidents in still water in a day. There can be zero, there can be one, there can be two. Notice that they are in an order. There cannot be anything between one and two. It could also be the number of senators voting on a bill or the number of days until a tornado hits Oklahoma. Notice that the number of days until a tornado hits Oklahoma could be a very, very, very large number. But it is still enumerable. It's zero if one ha hits today, one if one hits tomorrow, two, three, all the way up until, ostensibly it could go all the way up to infinity. Distributions receive a name when they are seen enough times in real life to be useful. And allow me to emphasize the in real life part. These distributions are handy because we know everything about them. Some named discrete distributions are the Bernoulli, the binomial, the Poisson, and the hypergeometric, etc. In each case, we know the formulas for the individual probabilities, for cumulative probabilities, for expected values, for variances, standard deviations, medians, interquartile ranges, etc. The purpose of this laboratory activity is to introduce you to discrete random numbers and to show you how to get R to calculate probabilities for you. So by the end of this part of the laboratory activity, this first part, this part A, you will be able to plot a probability function both in terms of the PMF, the probability mass function, and in terms of the cumulative distribution function. You'll be able to draw a random sample from a distribution, and you'll be able to estimate the mean and standard deviation of a distribution. And quite honestly, you'll be able to calculate them exactly. And so let us begin. The first step is to go to our documents folder, look for stat methods. This is lab activity. It's going to be activity four. Hopefully you've been keeping up with the structure. And there's lab 4Q and 4A. This will be the one we want, B and C. Let's start R. Set the working directory. Again, in PCs, it's going to be under file. Under max, it's going to be under miscellaneous. I just need to locate where everything is. And again, just to double check that I got it set in the right place, DIR, enter. Yep, looks like it's in the right place. So the next step is to start in File, New Script. And I'm going to put these side by side, which would be tile vertically. And I'll start. Step one, let's go to our Ott and Longnecker book, problem 441. That's chapter four, problem number 41 in the back. And we're going to actually do that problem. So the first step is to set the possible values for y. And that's one way of doing it. I'm going to run it, which in PCs, again, is Control-R. In Macs, it's Command-Enter. From this point forward, I'll refer to it as Control-R. To double check that we got it in there correctly, I'm going to click on the console window to turn focus over there, hit Y, and then Enter. And notice, again, it's from 0 through 10. Alternatively, if we wanted to, we didn't have to do that C notation. We could have done just Y is equal to 0 through 10. And that is a colon. 
those two lines are equivalent. From the problem, this is what we got. Probability of a 0 is 6%. Probability of 1 is 14%. Now I go back and make sure I got everything correct. So those, that P is now a vector of probabilities. Go over on the left side to the console window. Hit P, enter, and just to double check that I've got everything in there correctly. And it looks as though I do not. Always got to double check. That should be 0 0.14, 0 0.16, 0 0.14, 0 0.12, 0 0.10, 0 0.08. 07, 06, 04, 03. Rerun that. Again, just click over on the console, hit P and enter, just to double check that everything's in there correctly, and it looks to be that way now. Good. Now, let's plot the probability mass function here. Notice what I said is plot the probability mass function. The x variable, or the horizontal variable, is going to be y in this case. The vertical is going to be the probability. And that's what it will look like if you do it the ugly way. We could, if we so desired, pretty it up. And I'm sure we do desire that. Remember the three parts of any graphic. The first part is the parameter part. Last equals 1 makes the orientation of the labels horizontal. Family equals serif. Make sure that the, the what is typed out, the letters, the numbers, are all in serif font. And mar stands for margin, so this is going to set the margins takes four numbers. This is this four that's highlighted is four lines on the first side. And R defines the first side as the x-axis, the horizontal axis, the bottom. Four lines along the second side, which is the y-axis, the vertical axis, the left. Zero lines along the third side, which is the top. And zero lines along the right side which is the fourth side. That also makes some changes to the plot function. Not our, only are we going to do y and p, we're going to make sure we label our axes correctly. So the x label is going to be y. The y label is going to be probability. The box type, which is the what surrounds all the plotting area, so this right now this square is the box. We're going to say box type equals L. And that's a lowercase L. Just make it in the shape of an L. So it's only going to show the x and the y axis. Type equals H is going to give us spikes. I'm going to break this over two lines because it's so long. Y lim, which stands for the y limit or the limit on the y axis, is going to go from 0 to 0 0.18. Y axis, I'm going to make sure that that does not have any additional space on the inside. And the x axis, I'm going to just take away completely. So look at the left, where, what we have for our graphic right now. I'll highlight, I'll run it, and this is what it's going to look like. Hmm, looks like I have an error or something. Lab dash probability. Oh my goodness. I guess that should be y lab equals. So let's see the graphic again as it is before I run these four lines. Run the four lines, and that's what I hit get. 
Again, the type equals H gives us these vertical lines. The BTY equals lowercase l. Make sure that we only get the left and the bottom axes. The YAXS equals I. Make sure that we don't have any internal uh, margins. And the X AXT equals N means that we're not actually going to put out the X axis labels. We can add those ourselves. The next step is to put points at the top of each of those vertical bars. Not just any points, but PCH equals 16 is going to make them solid dots. And call equals red is going to make them red dots. Run that line and see what happens. Finally, we're going to add back that x-axis to make it look good. The axis function will do that. It takes at least two, or technically it takes at least one parameter. The first one is the side. Side equals one means it's going to be along the x-axis because the x-axis is the first axis. And then helps to specify where you want to put the labels at. And this is going to be from 0 to 10. So there is a graph of the probability mass function for y. And this matches what we get in, in Longnecker problem 441. Now with that, we can actually calculate some probabilities of elementary events. We can calculate the probability that y is equal to 1. probability y is equal to 1 is 0.14. Notice that p is the same as the variable for the probabilities. Notice that y is the variable that's the same as for the possible outcomes or for the sample space. Notice that this is a double equals. A double equals tests equality. A single equals will assign values. A double equals tests for equality. So y double equals 1 actually pulls out all those values of y that are exactly 1. These are square brackets. So what this is actually doing is it's looking in the variable p and only returning the square brackets part those values of p for which y is identically equal to 1. Similarly, we could do the same with y is 9. I want to find the probability that y is equal to 9. It's going to be 0 0.04. Probability that y is 5 is 0 0.01, or 10%. Again, it's the double equals test for the equality. Those are for elementary events. Now let's look for unions of elementary events. So the probability that y is 1 or y is 4 is the probability that y is equal to 1 plus the probability that y is equal to 4. Because the probability that y equals 1 is mutually exclusive of the probability that y is equal to 4, the probability of the union is just the sum of the two probabilities hit pause, rewind a bit, replay that last part so you understand it. It's very important. B, the probability that y is greater than or equal to 8. Remember that the largest that y can be is 10. So the probability that y is greater than or equal to 8 is the probability that y is equal to 8 plus the probability that y is equal to 9 plus the probability that y is equal to 10. Again, we can add those simply because the probability that y equals 8 and the probability that y equals 9 and the probability that y equals 10 do not overlap. y equals 8, y equals 9, and y equals 10 are mutually exclusive events. Therefore, the probability of their union is equal to the sum of their individual probabilities. 
Next, the probability that y is less than 3. Remember, the lowest that y can be is 1. So the probability that y is less than 3 is the probability that y is equal to 0 plus the probability that y is equal to 1 plus the probability that y is equal to 2 plus the probability, you know, it's not plus the probability of y equals 3 because probability that y is less than 3 does not include 3. If we wanted it to include 3, it would be the probability that y is less than or equal to 3. But we just want it to be less than 3. So the probability that y is less than 3 is 0.36. From the definition of mean, if we remember from our readings in Long-Necker, this is just the sum over all possible values of y of the value times the probability of that value. It's the sum of the value times the probability of that value. It's the sum of the value times the probability of that value. So the mean of y is 3.97 by definition. The variance we can use a couple definitions for variance. The basic definition for variance is just it's the sum of the squared deviances. With the sum of y minus the mean of y, which is 3.97, squared. This y minus 3.97 is just the deviances squared. And there's the sum of that. We could also calculate it using a different formula, which is just the sum of y squared minus the sum of y times p squared. Now notice I had a typographical error there. Um, for the variance, you can either calculate it as the deviances squared times their individual probabilities, and that's what I left out the first time, is times their individual probabilities, or using the formula that is most, us uh, that is most often used in calculations for variances for distributions. We can also calculate the standard deviation Recall the standard deviation is always equal to the square root of the variance. So it's the square root of, I don't care, pick one or the other. So the standard deviation is 2.662536. We can also calculate the cumulative sum. And we'd need to calculate the cumulative sum to estimate the median. Cumulative sum is just cum sum of p, and that's of the probabilities. And to calculate, to get a median, you just look for the first time that that cumulative sum of the probabilities hits 1 half. It hits 1 half here. That's y equals 0, y equals 1, y equals 2. So a median is at y equals 3. What's even more important is we can ca we can plot this cumulative distribution function, the CDF. And since we're going to plot it, it's helpful to use the plot command. Y cum sum of P. And I'll let you clean this up later. There's the cumulative sum. Notice the cumulative sum, or the, the CDF, the cumulative distribution function always increases. Well, technically, it just never decreases. We really, yeah, there we go. And I'll let you clean that up a bit. Make sure that it's lab three compliant. And the third thing we're going to talk about is random variables and actually drawing a sample from a random variable. 
Now the method will be slightly different when we have a name for a random variable. Here we have a generic random variable. Again, if we forget, p gives us the probability distribution for a random variable, and y gives us the sample space for a random variable. If I want to draw from such a random variable, I have to use the function sample. The first thing it takes is the y, all the possible y, all the possible values it can pull from. Second thing it takes is the probabilities of each of those y values, which we've actually stored in the variable p. Now, if I want to draw 10 values from this y distribution, I have to specify size is equal to 10. So the size is the number of values I want to draw. And I'm going to want to do replace equals true. Make sure the true is all caps, which means that I'm going to draw 10 values from the y distribution, replacing each time. So over on the left, we see 10 values from this y distribution where I replaced. And I knew I replaced because I've got 1, 2, 3, threes. So I had to replace, otherwise there would be at most 1, 3. Two sixes, again, had replacement, otherwise there'd be at most one six. There's two twos, etc. If I rerun that line, control R, I'll get a different sample because it's all random. Now, if I want to make sure that your numbers and my numbers agree, I have to set the seed. Set seed, the random number seed. And three for no reason other than it's a cool number. And I'm going to save this observation, uh, save this as the f variable OBS. So I'm going to do something with these. What am I going to do with them? I'm going to calculate the arithmetic mean. So if I run those three lines, and if you run those three lines, we will all get 3.7 for the arithmetic mean. If we run those three lines, all three lines again, we're going to get 3.7 for our arithmetic mean. If we run those three lines again, what do we get? 3.7 for the arithmetic mean. And the reason we keep getting the same number over and over and over is because of the set seed function. If I just run the bottom two lines, I'll get something different. If you also run those bottom two lines, you will agree with me that it's 3.3. If you run those bottom two lines again, we will all get four. If you, we all run those two bottom again, we'll get three. If I run those all three lines again, I'll get what number? Let's see if you're paying attention. We'll get 3.7. because we're starting the seed back at 3 again. Now, if I want to estimate the mean of y, I mean, notice that we calculated exactly way up here. If I want to estimate the mean, then instead of size equals 10, I'm going to make it something like size equals a million. A million is 1 times 10 to the power of 6. So I run those three lines since I changed the size to a million. I'm going to estimate that my average for y or the mean for y or the expected value for y is 3.968335. If you ran those three lines together, you will agree with me. Notice how that compares to the actual mean of the distribution, which is 3.97. Pretty close. Not too bad for an estimate. So that's the end of part A for this. Notice what we did in this, in this part. We looked at a generic probability function. We figured out how to plot both the probability mass function and the cumulative distribution function. We drew a random sample from that distribution. 
not only did we estimate the mean and the standard deviation and the variance of that distribution, but we calculated those three quantities exactly, which is very powerful. So in the future, we're going to do a lot more with simulation. However, for right now, we've gotten far enough. In part B of this lab, we're going to examine the first two named distributions, the Bernoulli distribution and the binomial distribution. I look forward to seeing you then.